me. Uh, my name is Lourdes. I'm from Eco Schools Canada. I'd like to welcome uh, everyone here, our presenters, our Zoom host. Um, again, this session is the Flood Ed Challenge by Sydney Howlett. Uh, I am your facilitator today, Lourdes, uh, and our Zoom host today uh, is Ashley. Uh, so just a reminder that this session is being recorded. Uh, so if you would prefer uh, to have your camera off, we welcome that as well. Um, yeah, and I think I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. Um, just give me a second as I figure out all these technical details. Perfect. Uh, Ashley, can you just give me a quick thumbs up if you can see uh, my screen right now? Not yet. Um, yeah, we're good. Perfect. Amazing. Okay, great. Um, uh, so I'm just, uh, I'd like to start off with a light acknowledgement. Uh, so the conference is um, being hosted uh, on Toronto, and I also live and reside uh, in. Toronto. Uh, so we acknowledge the traditional territory upon which the conference is being hosted. For many thousands of years, the Huron Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit, have sought to walk gently on this land. This territory is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as, as, well as by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement between the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes. This acknowledgement signals our desire to seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on honor and deep respect, and is a starting point to remind us all to enact this work in our personal and professional lives. So at this time, I'd just like to uh, ask folks to share maybe in the chat uh, where they're uh, residing today, uh, where they're experiencing a conference, um, and just to, uh, yeah, like let us know where you are. I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen there. Perfect. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to um, introduce uh, our presenter, Sydney Howlett. Uh, so Sibby is the engagement manager at Green Learning, where she is the primary point of contact and support for teachers implementing Green Learning's energy and climate education programs in their classrooms. Uh, she is a former Ontario teacher with a passion for creating positive social change and a sustainable future through education. So welcome, Sydney. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome everyone and happy Earth Week. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. So again, today I'm going to be talking about the Flood Ed Challenge, which is um, an extreme weather preparedness program. So just to give you a little bit more information about me, um, I'm actually a former Ontario teacher myself. I've taught um, from kindergarten to grade eight, including English, core French and French immersion, um, all the way around Toronto actually. So north of you in um, on Barrie and Aurelia, east of you in Peterborough and west of you in Guelph and Alora. Now I reside in Kitchener Waterloo and I have the pleasure of working for an organization called Green Learning. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, Green Learning um, is a national not-for-profit organization that creates free online education programs about energy, climate change, and green economy. Our mission is to engage and empower students to create a positive change for their future, which is what I'm going to be showing you today. So I know I've said a little bit about me, but I would love to know who else is in the room. We have a pretty small group today, so I'd love for this to be um, a really engaging and interactive time for us. So if you don't mind putting in the chat, oh, I see we might have some FSL teachers, um, what you teach, um, either what grades or what subjects you focus on. Um, that way, as we're going through um, the activities, I can really highlight what's most relevant for you folks. So if you wanted to take a minute and do that, that would be awesome. Um, and if you are learning virtually blended, um, I will be covering quite a few different areas, but just gives me a better idea of who's in the room. 
Um, so I do like to do an, a land acknowledgement as well. So I didn't put it in the chat, but I am personally located on the Haldeman Track, which is land that was promised to the Six Nations people. Um, and it's the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee's people. Now, when I typically do a land acknowledgement, I love to showcase a digital tool. Um, so when I was teaching, I focused a lot on coding, robotics, and incorporating digital tools in the classroom. One of these tools is called native-land.ca. Um, and if you are interested, I'm happy to drop these in the chat. Um, but essentially, this is an interactive world map that you can look at the different territories, treaties, or languages. Um, so this can bring up all different kinds of conversations with students. For example, why some territories overlap or why some treaties, why there are some locations that don't have any treaties. Um, so a really great resource here. But um, the thing I would like to drop in the chat for you here is actually a digital handout. Um, so I encourage you to actually go and download this either to your computer or into your personal Google Drive. Um, so this does outline all of the links that I'm going to be going through today in a really comprehensive order. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be going through the Flood Ed program, which is our flood, uh, extreme weather preparedness program. So what I've done here is I've actually outlined the steps for completing the flood ed challenge here so that as I'm going through the activities, you can highlight which activities you think might fit best with your class. Whoops. Um, you can make notes here on how you would integrate it or other connections that you can make to your curriculum. So I encourage you to use this highlight and make notes as we go through the program. You do have view only access so you will need to download download that again to your computer or to your Google Drive. Um, but that's for you to use throughout the workshop. So all of our programs here at Green Learning relate directly to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these are 17 goals that have been outlined by the United Nations on how we can create a prosperous future. And that goes for both people and the environment. So um, the flood ed program relates directly to number six, clean water and sanitation. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities. And number 14, life be below water. And that connection might not be clear, but I'll really explain how stormwater runoff can impact the health and livelihood of our waterways. Um, this within itself is a great digital tool. Um, so if you actually are focusing in on one of these SDGs or sustainable development goals, you can go to this goal and within this website, you have all kinds of digital graphics that you can use with your students. There are events here that are both suitable for teachers and students. You have additional information that you can read about. And my personal favorite part is this news section. So any relevant news articles about that SDG will be found here. So this is a really easy way to connect things to your um, language arts curriculum or um, any other curriculum that you're looking to hit. Um, I also have here the SDG tracker. So this is SDG tracker.org. This is actually a resource I came across only this week and I'll drop that in the chat as well. This is a student friendly website designed to track progress towards those sustainable development goals. So what actually happens here is that somebody has put together um, this resource for students where students can actually see in real time how we're progressing and how we're tracking that progress towards those goals. Um, so really great information here and you can send your students directly to this resource. So that's just a really brief overview of what our programs connect to and what they're based off of. They do connect directly to the curriculum as well. So we are a national organization and try and identify as many curriculum connections as we can in our programs. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be going through our flood ed program. Now this, I'm going to be going through it right directly in our website so that later on when it's time for you um, to actually access these resources, you're able to navigate the website appropriately. You're welcome to follow along with me if you're somebody who likes to explore on your own while you listen, I encourage you to open up those links as I go through them and check them out. I'm not going to go through the curriculum connections in depth, but if you want to have a look, you can find them here. This program relates directly to grades four to 12, primarily in geography and math, but there are lots of connections in general science um, and social studies as well. Um, so you can have a look there. All of our programs also feature some backgrounders. So if you've never um, learned about flooding before, you have no experience with flooding, that's okay. We're gonna give you all the tools that you need. So all the information I'm sharing with you today is all stuff I've actually learned from these backgrounders. 
So the first thing I'm going to start with, and I'm actually going to head back over here, <clears throat> is our learning outcomes and a little bit about flooding. So by the end of the workshop today, I'm hoping that you are able to incorporate FloodEd's programs and lessons and activities into, into your learning plan. I hope that you're able to identify a range of digital tools and strategies for teaching about flooding. And I hope that you feel comfortable completing the flood ed challenge with your students. So now I'm just gonna go through a couple of different types of flooding, and then I'm gonna open up the stage um, for you to just share what type of flooding you've experienced, if you've experienced any, if the region that you're tuning in from is um, in flood risk area for whatever reason, um, and what interested you in the flood ed challenge today. So the first type of flooding I'm going to talk about is river flooding. So this is essentially very simple. It's when rivers or streams overflow, and that can be caused to snow melt, um, excess rain, um, or a buildup in the water system that causes things to overflow. So that's the first type of flooding. Then we have flash floods. So this is what happens. These are typically really quick floods, and they wash away all kinds of water, debris, um, down roads, streams, whatever it may be typically caused by high rainfall. It can also be caused by um, extreme snow melt as well. So if um, we go from having really cold weather with lots of snow, and then all of a sudden one day is really warm and all that snow melts, that can cause a flash flood. Coastal floods, again, are pretty simple. Um, this is where um, obviously along the coast, um, severe rainfall, storms cause water to um, come up onto the shore. Very similar to storm surge, where um, again, the surge is coming onto land. The last one is inland flooding. So this is a result of um, constant rain, precipitation, um, and the rain just honestly has nowhere to go and so it builds up. So my question for you is, have you experienced any flooding um, in your area? Is your area at risk of flooding? If so, what type of risk is it at? And what interested you in the flood ed program? Are you interested in general extreme weather preparedness, specifically flooding? Um, what, what brought you here today? So I'm encouraging you right now to drop that in the chat. If you feel comfortable turning on your camera or your mic, you're welcome to share um, orally. Again, I mentioned we have a fairly small group today. So if you do want to share, we have the time and capacity for that. So I'd love to know what it is you're working with and where you're coming from. Hi there, I could start. My name's Jana. Oh, thank you. Hi, my camera's off because I just finished a dance class and I'm just far too sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I'm from Winnipeg, which is basically like um, uh, we live on, on a river. Basically, it's just a very, very vast wetland and prairie um and right now my students are doing an inquiry looking at water as life and um and they none of them have been were alive during some of our greatest floods so they, for them the idea of flooding is not as prominent as it is for me and my experiences seeing our city like just surrounded by by basically lakes um, during a 97 flood so yeah that's what brought me here and seeing how i can bring this into the classroom basically next week Awesome. Perfect. That's great. Did anyone else want to share um, either what type of flood they experience or what brought them here today and what they're hoping to get out of the session? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll share um, and I'll, I'll try to turn my camera on. Um, so I, um, I'm teaching grade eight and um, in terms of the flooding I've experienced when I was a child living in Montreal, we had a, um, a massive thaw and we had sewage coming up through our basement drains. It went up to about uh, two feet deep in certain parts of the basement, which was finished at the time. And in terms of what brought me here is um, I'm doing um, water systems with my grade eight class and I'm combining it with geography. And we're looking at climate change as sort of a, a, a mover in terms of population relocation and migration. And we're looking kind of at what we have in our urbanized uh, environment in terms of the water cycle and how we've changed that up. So how we're um, gonna exacerbate flooding and Toronto is one of the areas that's uh, uh, forecast to be more impacted by climate change. So that's kind of what brought me here. Thank you, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. I see somebody maybe have put something in the chat. Um, lots of historic flooding in London. Yes, watersheds. Um, you work as a community educator for local conservation authority. 
but in monitoring mitigation. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, if you wanted to put more information in the chat, you're welcome to do so as well. I encourage you to use the chat actively throughout this workshop. If you notice something interesting or you have an additional comment to add, um, we're here to build on each other's knowledge. Um, so I encourage you to do that throughout. I might not get to that at the uh, throughout the workshop, but I will leave some time at the end for general questions. So you're welcome to put them in throughout and then I'll come back to them at the end. So without further ado, let's dive into the flat ed program. So this program is divided up into two sections. First, the learning activities and second, the take action activities. So the learning activities is really where we're going to get that foundational knowledge about flooding, climate change and their connection. So I'm actually going to go through these activities with you today. Um, and this is where I encourage you to make notes on that sheet of where you think this would fit with your learning plan. If you have any questions, again, throw them in the chat there. Okay, so I apologize, my internet might be a little bit slow today, I guess it's taking a while to load, but our first activity in this program, and you don't have to do these activities sequentially, and you also don't have to do all these activities. So this program is meant to give you all the information that you need, but just take and, um, take and choose what's most appropriate for your class or what's going to fit with your schedule. So the first activity is understanding flooding. And here we start with a number of different videos. And so as I mentioned, there's quite an age range for this program from grade four to eight. And so in each of these activities, we also give you gear up and gear down options. So as you can see, this, um, this, first, acti this first video here is obviously geared towards younger students. As you scroll down, you will get to the videos that are more appropriate for the older ages. So I encourage you, you're welcome to show your students all these videos, um, but go through them first and see what's most appropriate for your students. I would say um, for the most part, grade, the younger grades, these two are appropriate. I would say under grade six, anything else, I would go with the second two videos. So you're welcome to make that note um, for whatever grade you're teaching on your sheet. From there, we really focus in on place-based. So Flood Ed is a completely place-based program where we wanna focus on flooding in your region. So we don't care that um, there's lots of flooding on the coast if you're not on the coast. So we want this to be really specific to your area. So the first step is really understanding flooding in your area, okay? And for this, we use backgrounders. So all of our backgrounders that you have here that has that um, just foundational knowledge for students, are student friendly. So you can not only read it for your own knowledge, which is exactly what I do, but you can pass these right on to your students, um, assign it as a reading task, or even just as an introduction to this topic. We actually give you for every province and territory exactly where you can find your weather averages data. Okay, so I encourage you to send your students here and explore what weather patterns look like in their area. So I'm just going to pick a random town. Actually, Barrie is my hometown, so I'm going to pick this one. And you can actually look and see, you know, look at the precipitation, extreme daily rainfall. This information is going to help you get to know what rainfall looks in your looks like in your area. And this data is actually going to be used throughout the program time and time again. And I'll show you exactly what that means. But when I'm referring to your specific um, weather data, this is what I mean. This is only one resource that you can use to find this information. We outline a few throughout the program. So if you want to start your students here and then have them explore and maybe compare with a different resource, that's a great learning opportunity as well. There's also lots of math opportunities throughout this program, which is a personal favorite of mine because I'm a big math person. You can look at graphing, looking at trends, predicting future. Sure. Um, make sure you're using this data dynamically. So while we don't outline all of this within the program, there's lots of opportunity to connect even further to those um, core curriculums as well. We give you all kinds of different discussion questions comparing to different provinces, territories, or regions. Um, so when you compare things to other regions, students get a better idea of what is normal and what can be expected. From here, we actually have the activity of how much rainfall falls at your school during a rain event. And this is found, all of these sheets are actually found in our additional resources, which I think is the gold of this program, is the additional resource section, because that's where a lot of the place-based worksheets are, of where students can actually figure out what's relevant to their location. So in this particular activity, we're just showing you exactly how to calculate the volume of rain that falls on your school grounds at any given time. Okay, and the way I would do this, particularly as we're learning um, 
distance learning or online learning is I actually use Google Maps for that. So I don't know if you know this, um, but Google Maps is an extremely dynamic tool to be used, um, particularly in geography and even in math. So I actually hosted a flood ed workshop this past week with classrooms from four different provinces, and they all did the data for their specific location through Google Maps. So one way that you can calculate the surface area of your school with Google Maps is actually by right clicking anywhere on the map, measure distance right here at the bottom, and I can actually measure the distance of any area. So I'm gonna just measure this block here. And as you can see, this is actually my home location. And if I actually connect these dots back to the beginning, this is actually gonna give me automatically my area. So I not only know the perimeter, but now I know the area. And I can use that information to figure out how much rain is falling in my area in any given rain event. What I would actually suggest is that you flip over to the satellite view. I find this a little bit easier to work with when I'm working with um, school locations, just because typically they appear as one giant blob on the traditional map, whereas the satellite, you can actually differentiate between where your sidewalks end and where your schoolyard ends. So that's one tool that you can use here. I'm actually going to be coming back to Google Maps a few times throughout this workshop and showing you a number of different ways that you can use it and leverage this tool uh, for distance learning. So if you have any questions about Google Maps, I encourage you to put that in the chat. I will give you again some time at the very end just to try these out for yourself and ask any questions while I'm here to support you. Okay, so now that we know what rainfall um, in our area, how much is fall, how much that looks like in volume of water. So again, we're talking about math here. Then we have some discussion questions. So obviously we want our students to be critical thinkers and think beyond just the basic facts. Okay, so what does this mean? What does that mean this much water is falling here in our school during any given rain events? What can we do with this information? From here, we also use a lot of case studies and real examples. So um, one of you mentioned that you um, had experienced flooding in the 97 Winnipeg flood. So we actually use that case study within this program. So we focus a lot on real events that have happened and what response people actually had to those um, extreme weather events. So here is just one example of a case study where students can really understand what the risks of flooding are and what the um, outcome and impact can be financially, socially, environmentally through real case studies. So our goal is really to make this as relevant as possible for students. We're not thinking abstract ideas here. We're thinking real events that have happened. Again, if you want more information and your students are maybe really hooked on this activity, at the end of every activity, we have all the resources where we've gained our information. So if you want more information, you can go there. You can also direct your students to those resources as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the second activity, which are what are floodplains and watersheds? Okay, so this is really where that geography piece comes in, where you can look at the different landscapes, either in your area, you can look at it as a province wide, or even if you're looking at, at it on a national scale. Again, you can use Google Maps to identify this. We've given you a couple of different videos that can explain things, and you can assign these as asynchronous or synchronous tasks. My favorite part about this activity is actually the modeling part of it. And I'm just going to show you a really brief um, part of this video around uh, two minutes. So this is actually where students are building and testing out flooding infrastructure. Okay, so if you lived, for example, in a watershed, what would happen if a 100 year storm occurred and you got a downpour of rain? So students can actually take water pour it into their model and see using their paper houses what impact that would have you know are we just getting a little bit on the edge just the basement flood are you getting a full flood what's happening there then they can adjust it based on what you're dealing with so if you're dealing with coastal floods if you're just dealing with river floods whatever it may be you can adjust your model um, to, to fit that specific need in your place-based area OK, so I personally really love this activity. I find it really helpful for students to see visually what happens, especially if they've never experienced flooding. Um, this is a really hands on STEM based way to get them interacting with that information. From here, we want to know where is your school located? How is this relevant again to your place? 
and we give you all kinds of information um, where you can find out that information as well and some additional resources. So you are not alone at any step in this process, okay? We give you all the resources and tools that you need. Not only that, but if you register for one of our programs, which um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but everything is completely free. All of Green Learning's resources and anything I show you here today can be accessed for free. Um, I will actually support you in completing this program. So my role with Green Learning as the engagement manager is I actually support educators, both formal and informal, in implementing these programs and connecting it with what you're already doing. So if you already have a project going on looking at water cycles, I can talk with you and help you find out where the gaps are maybe in your learning plan and where these activities can fit for you. Moving on, again, I'm going back to the learning activities. I'm going into the flooding and, flood and climate change. So we as educators, we know that there's a huge link between flooding and climate change, particularly extreme weather. So as the world gets warmer, as um, weather becomes more extreme, those 100 year storms are no longer 100 year storms. They're becoming more frequent. Some places are even experiencing two to 300 year storms in a single year. So those storms are, they have about a 1% chance of happening or a one in 100 chance. Um, so that's becoming more and more evident across the world, which is then causing more issues. Not only that, but the melting of our ice caps and the rising of sea levels is causing a lot of issues around coastal regions and impacting our water systems. So in order to really discover the flooding and climate change link, we have a um, documentary called Displaced. And we actually give you a guide on how to go about talking about this with your students. Some of our other programs actually have full introductions to climate change. So I'm actually gonna hop over to our Decoding Carbon program right now. It's not a program I'm going to talk about, but I just wanna show you the very first module in this program that can actually be used independently of this program. So this, is, this module is called, What is Climate Change and How Does It Shape Our World? And this is all about giving students that foundational knowledge of what is climate change? How did we get to where we are today with climate modeling? What are the global impacts that this is having on our environment? So you can actually use these activities, one of them or all of them, if you're introducing your students to climate change for the very first time. This activity will introduce them to climate change, but not as in-depth as some teachers really like. There are also all kinds of different documentaries out there that you can use. For example, if your students have seen this um, or you wanna go a different way with it. Um, one that I'm going to suggest, uh, I apologize, I have a hundred tabs open here to show you today is Before the Flood. So this is a documentary with my favorite man, Leonardo DiCaprio, where he actually goes around the world um, and learns about the impacts of climate change. And uh, I'll tell you, I know one school in out in New Brunswick who watched Uh, Sydney, did we lose Sydney? Well, uh, it wouldn't be a virtual conference without a uh, virtual technicality. I think at this point, while Sydney is reconnecting, um, if you have any questions so far uh, from the presentation, if you could just drop them into the chat. Um, and also at this time, I would invite you to uh, check out, or sorry, open any of the links and resources that Sydney has uh, shared in the chat. Once we close this window, um, you won't be able to access them. Um, and then, of course, uh, if you'd like to talk to Sydney further, um, there are many opportunities uh, throughout the day to uh, network and connect um, over at our Eco Expo. Um, I think Sydney will be sharing um, her contact later on, hopefully, <laughs> if she can come back. Uh, so you can always contact her directly. Just keeping an eye um, on our waiting room right now, and hopefully Sydney can come back. I have uh, some 
questions. Um, one thing that a lot of our students are finding is is this kind of like video. Oh, she's back. Never mind. Hello. I'm so sorry. I've just come closer to my router. Um, I hope you're still able to hear me okay. Uh, we just cut out just as you were starting to introduce the documentary. Oh, okay. Awesome. So I just really wanted to, um, let me just share my screen here again, um, to showcase that that's not the only documentary available. So if your students, um, I know particularly right now with everyone at home, um, recommending documentaries is a great opportunity for student learning and it can really get students excited and empower them um, with the changes that they can make. Um, so I just wanted to recommend this other Before the Flood, which is where Leonardo DiCaprio is actually going around the world. Um, and looking at what the impacts of climate change are having on the environment. Um, so that's a great resource as well. Um, I'm just going to continue on here if that's okay. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put those in the chat. I apologize, my internet apparently is not very good today. So now we're gonna get into, um, oh, I skipped the flood mapping tour. So we're actually gonna go to the flood mapping tour. But before I head over to that one, I wanna show you some of our additional resources. So our flood mapping tour looks at flooding infrastructure, and that might not be familiar terms to you or your students. I know for me as an educator, that was completely new to me. So we have all the tools that you need here. Not only do we have a key terms uh, area, so if you're um, if terms like 100 year storm are new to you or downspouts are new, you can find all that information there. But I really particularly like the um, the photo gallery, because this is where students can actually use this and match what they see in their community to what infrastructure um, and what it's properly called. So for example, culverts or swales. Um, so in the flooding infrastructure mapping tour, students are actually walking around their community, looking for these different flooding infrastructure and mapping them. And from that, they can deduce the flood risk of their region. Now, one thing I'm going to let you all know is that flooding infrastructure is typically pretty old, especially in older communities. When was the last time that your entire street was um, ripped up and your drains removed, right? So we have to take this into account because climate is changing. Weather patterns are changing and our flooding infrastructure needs to reflect those changes. So identifying first what infrastructure you have and then looking at it from a critical lens with your students. And again, I would actually use Google Maps for this. So if you're not able to take your students on a physical walk around your community, you can use Google Maps again. And so I'm actually just grabbing this little man here at the bottom and I'm gonna place him uh, really anywhere on a street. And I'm gonna take a walk through Google Street, okay? You can see actually this street is being redone. So what the students would do is you're actually walking through the street and I'm looking right now on the ground and I'm looking for grates because that's one of the biggest flooding infrastructure, particularly for roads that are non-permeable surfaces or can't absorb water, which means all that water needs to run off to somewhere. So grates are really important. And you know what? As I'm walking, I'm not even seeing any right now. Oh, there we go. There I saw my first one. So your students can actually plot this on a map that they can save right within Google Maps. This connects to another take action activity, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. So you can use the image gallery, Google Maps, or go on a physical walk around your community to map this flooding infrastructure and really get to know flooding infrastructure. From here, we wanna talk about flood risk. What is the risk of your area? We want students to be able to come to those conclusions on their own. And how we do that is by studying previous floods. Okay, so um, there's a couple of examples here. If you've experienced flooding in your region, I encourage you to look up articles and information of specifically to your region. We give a couple and we try throughout our program to give some in different provinces as well. You'll notice that a lot of them are um, centered in Ontario and Alberta. That's where green learning has our biggest presence. But just this year, we've been expanding more nationally. So we are looking to add other types of case studies into this program as well. So this asks those high level questions of why should we be concerned about flooding? What are the effects on our communities? So again, that's relating back to those SDGs and resilient communities, okay? Um, so going through these, students can learn so much information about how to manage flood risk, what are the options of managing flood risk, and what are the best opportunities? From here, 
Now we know all about what is flooding, what our risk is in our personal area. We know how we can um, address flooding from past experiences. Now we want to prepare for flood resilience, which is a really important step when we're talking about extreme weather. This is where you can empower your students, particularly if when talking about climate change, your students have a lot of eco anxiety or anxiety about the impending doom that we always talk about with climate change, knowing that they can prepare themselves and that there's stuff that they can do in order to combat climate change is so empowering and so beneficial for their eco anxiety. Um, so I would recommend if you are picking and choosing activities, making sure that you're giving um, at least the opportunity for students to take um, to take action and be empowered and do something is really important and not just focusing on the doom and gloom that is um, extreme weather and climate change. So here again, we use real life examples of cities resilience plans. So for those of you who are out in Alberta, if you wanted to look at the Calgary flood resilience plan, I'm going to open up the Toronto region um, today just because that's close to my region. And you can actually look and see what other regions, municipalities, organizations are doing as part of their flood protection plan and use that as influence for your own flood resilience plan of your own school. So for example, in Toronto, they focus a lot on prevention and mitigation, obviously, preparedness, response, and recovery. So you can actually go through these flood resilience plans and learn all about other ways that you can adapt, um, prepare, and recover from flooding. Okay, so I'm going to head back on over here and I'm actually going to jump. So that's all of our learning activities, but I'm actually going to jump into our additional resources here. And I mentioned earlier that this is a gold mine. This is my favorite section of the program. So how much surface area in your school is permeable? This is an activity that I did this past week in the workshop. And what I did is we actually created permeability maps of our school. So here's an example of a permeability map. So you can see this map is actually saved right in Google Maps and it was done completely on Google Maps. I actually outlined, we discussed what permeability means and what runoff water means. So just to give you all an, an idea in case you're unfamiliar, permeability of the surface is essentially how much rain can be absorbed into that ground. So in nature, obviously in forests or on grass, water is absorbed right into the ground. Water is then goes through, it's filtered by all the roots, all the dirt, and then goes back into our water streams that way. Unfortunately, in urban areas, we don't have a ton of grass, a ton of forest, and a ton of surface area where that water can be absorbed. We're full of sidewalks and streets and homes that actually cause runoff water. And runoff water is essentially water that runs on land, and must be diverted somewhere else. It cannot be absorbed where it lands. And that can cause all kinds of issues with climate change. And this is where it connects to protecting our waterways. So for example, if water was to run off my house and I didn't have any downspouts, and that was just running, for example, on my driveway, running down and then into the great system, as that water runs, it could pick up the oil that dripped off of my car. It could pick up the litter that's on my street before going down into the grates. And where does that grate lead? Directly to streams and waterways, which eventually leads to our oceans. That means that that's dragging all kinds of toxins, chemicals, debris, garbage into directly into our waterways because we don't have the infrastructure right now in order to clean that. So it's really important that students understand the impact of stormwater runoff. So with this permeability map, we can look right away and we had we color coded ours. So we did red were the non permeable surfaces so you can see here, obviously, um, water is not being absorbed in the school on the pavement or in our parking lots. We have the semi permeable surfaces. So that's where some of the water is absorbed, but some of it is runoff. So that includes our gravel pits here where students play. And then we have our permeable surfaces. So that's the grass, um, the playground, the soccer field where water can be um, easily uh, absorbed into the ground. From this, we can look and I already know the risk areas of my school, okay? So from particular stormwater runoff, I know that probably in my parking lot, I'm having a lot of ponding or pooling, which is where water, when it rains, it has nowhere to go. It has nowhere to drain. And so you just get these giant puddles, which can be super fun for students to play with, 
but aren't really great for the environment because that water needs to be diverted somewhere, right? So that's just an, one way that you can use um, the permeability map to talk about flood risk at your school and have a really solid visual of how students can, um, can see where the flood risks are. Continuing on with those additional activities or additional resources, um, I believe we already talked about how much volume of rain falls during a water event, but what does that mean? What can we do with that information? Well, let's calculate how many rain barrels we would need to collect all that rainwater. Is it possible to collect the rainwater off of our school? If you know the volume of water that's falling on a non-permeable area, you can make a plan to divert that water somewhere else and we have resources here to help you. Now, my absolute favorite activity is the runoff footprint. This is hands down what I think is uh, the most useful math uh, focused activity in the program. So it's actually calculating your personal runoff footprint. And we do have a runoff footprint calculator as a tool built into this program. So first off, students are measuring the permeability of surfaces. And this is the activity that I did um, this past week. And we use Google Maps in order to calculate the area and then labeled them as permeable, non-permeable, and semi-permeable. From that, we were able to calculate the permeability percentage. Now that brought up the topic of what should our permeability percentage is? What's the ideal? Obviously, ideally, we would have 100% permeability. Um, you can have that with green roofs, um, with um, permeable asphalt. It is a possibility. Obviously, that's not realistic for most of us. So assessing where you currently are and setting a goal of where you'd like to be is always a great place to start. So these are all downloadable um, activity sheets for students. So if you want your students participating in this, all you have to do is head over here, quickly download that resource, and it's ready to implement in your class. Again, calculating rainfall amounts. Now, this is specific to your area again. So you want to have a couple sample storms, but you also want to look at those really extreme weather events. So what would happen in worst case scenario, the most rain is falling, how much water are we going to be dealing with in volume? Now, this is where it gets really exciting with the calculating your runoff footprint. So again, we give you a handout that shows you exactly how to do that. But really here, you can put this information into the calculator. So for example, if you have maybe 15 millimeters of rainfall are coming this weekend, you can put in all of your surface area and you can do this for your school, for your home, for your community, any location that you wanna focus in on. We obviously throughout the program talk a lot about your school, um, but feel free to be flexible. If you want your students talking about their personal home, you can have that as well. Hit calculate and that's gonna tell you exactly how many liters of water are running off of that surface, okay? So this is a really handy tool to talk about all kinds of different take action activities, which is where this is going to take me next. So as part of our programs, we like to have a culminating task, or as we refer to them, is a take action challenge. So this is where students are putting those skills, knowledge, resources that they've gained throughout the program or throughout the series of activities into measurable environmental action. How we do that is through the flooded challenge. So part of the flooded challenge is being able to take action through these take action activities. Now we give you a number of activities to start with, but you are by no means limited by what we have here. So again, I mentioned, we have the activity and the additional resources of how many barrels would your school need to collect rainwater. Once you figure that out, what's stopping you from actually installing a rain barrel and capturing some of that rainwater? Really great opportunity for students to do all kinds of measurement with volume, all kinds of prediction um, with future weather trends and how much water they think they're going to collect. Um, so lots of great scientific math based activities here. Um, what are you going to use that water for? Maybe you're going to use it to water a plant or a garden. So again, I mentioned that planting trees in gardens actually helps to filter rainwater before it gets put back into our streams with help which helps protect our water systems. Um, so this is an important step that we need to be thinking about. Adopt a drain campaign is my personal favorite activity. So as I mentioned, when you're walking along with your Google Street View um, and you find drains, um, I think in the act, when I was walking down the street, oh, this drain is nice and clear, that's awesome. 
oftentimes what you'll find is that there's debris such as garbage or even leaves that have fallen that actually pile up on top of these grates. So this causes two issues. One, some of that can actually fall into the grate and then goes into our water stream. And two, it acts as a blockage. So the next time we have an extreme wet uh, rain event, not as much water is able to flow out and be diverted, which means it has the opportunity to build up. So as part of the take action activities, we challenge you to actually adopt a drain in your community. And what that entails is giving um, your students the power to clean up that drain, keep it free of any debris, make sure that the water is flowing properly, but most importantly, to educate their community about one, where does that drain go? Contact your, your local municipality and ask them. They are more than happy to help you find out that information and are actually really excited when students uh, take an interest in the waterways. Oftentimes, this is a great opportunity to connect your classroom with a classroom expert. Um, so this is where your students and you have the opportunity to ask somebody who's in the field relevant questions. Um, Again, we have some other activities here that are a little bit more home uh, based. So if you are learning distance learning, this is what I would recommend for you. The home for, for uh, the flood protect your home, sorry, is actually a series of questions. So it's an app developed by the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation. I've done this survey for my own home, um, so I can actually show you what that looks like. And it, um, uh, where are we here? Here we go. So it actually goes through and tells you the areas where you're doing well for flooding protection. And then it gives you some ideas on how you can go about becoming more resilient to flooding. So for example, um, this is what was indicated for me and it even tells you how much it's going to cost and whether you're able to do it yourself. So you can accurately plan and make a long-term plan to become more resilient to flooding at home. Very similar to this, um, a bit of a downgraded or geared down version is the home protector scavenger hunt. So this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a scavenger hunt around your home looking for flooding infrastructure. So this is where we're looking, okay, do you have any downspouts? Where are your downspouts pointed? How far are they from your home? Um, looking at your different windows even, is there any seepage in there? Is your basement safe? So this is where students can actually make decisions on their own. Which leads me to the flood ed challenge. So this challenge actually allows students to create their own flood resilience plan for their school. And I've outlined on that handout, digital handout, exactly the steps and questions you need to answer to go about doing this. If obviously this year is um, particularly challenging, you're not able to take action, submit your flood resilience plan anyways. We have some really fantastic prizes for you to win. Cash prizes that you can actually use to purchase rain barrels or materials to plant a rain garden or whatever it is that you feel you need for your school. So um, I apologize, I didn't leave a ton of time at the very end here, like I mentioned, um, but I do wanna give you a chance um, right now. We have two minutes. If you have any questions, um, I apologize. I haven't been um, keeping up with the chat, but I will give you a chance right now if you wanted to um, unmute yourself and share anything about how you would use this program in your classroom, any barriers you see to using this program or any questions you have. Um, again, my email is on that digital handout and I encourage you to get in touch with me if you want to talk more about this or any of our other programs. Okay, so I will just um, have a little quick look through the questions here.